As you can clearly tell, I'm not Allison Sauls. Allison has come down with a gnarly sinus infection. And we got a call yesterday, and she said, Chad, I'm so, so sorry. And I'm so sorry they have to hear you again. When I told them, when you told them I would be here. No, she didn't say that. She's a lot nicer. But it was appropriate because there has just been a conversation in my heart that has been like resonating with the conversations that we have been having. Uh, our series right now about leveling up, about taking a next step in faith. Um, this was the sermon that got cut from our fear series. It's just appropriate so much to where I think we are right now. And so we decided to go off book a little bit. Allison will be back next weekend. And we'll continue on. But we're going to share a story this morning from the Gospels about uh, what happens when we're willing to take a chance. And something that's just so terribly important in our lives. What happens when we are willing to take a chance? What happens when we are willing to go to where we feel like we just can't go? As we take those steps forward in maturity of life, whether it's in our faith or whether it's in like every single thing we're doing, what happens when we're willing to take a step in and get outside of our comfort zone? And so we're going to be reading a story this morning from the Gospel of Luke. So if you turn your Bibles with me uh, to chapter 18, you can also read it uh, on your phone or you can read it up on the screen. Uh, but here, this, this story about Jesus and his travels. So Luke 18, verse 35 through 43. This is what it says. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. When he heard the noise of a crowd going past, he asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. And so he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the people in front of him yelled. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and ordered that the man be brought to him. And as the man came near to Jesus, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said, all right, receive your sight, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus, praising God. And all who saw it praised God too. So we have this story from the Gospels. And in this story, there's three characters. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at the relationship that these three characters have to each other. The first is there's obviously Jesus. And we, we know him. We see him there. We realize the story is about him. But the, the next two characters are where things get interesting. The first is there's this character, the crowd. Now, you might be saying, Chad, that's not a character. That's a bunch of people. But if we look inside of, of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see that there are stories upon stories upon stories of this crowd of people. So if we think back to the, the Bible stories, remember when we were a little kid, like the feeding of the 5,000. That 5,000 is the crowd. We think back just a few weeks ago to the week before Easter, there's a story of the triumphal entry. Uh, some of you might know it as Palm Sunday. That group of people that was waiting to greet Jesus was the crowd. This crowd is all throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the four books we call the Gospels. And inside of it, this crowd is made up of a bunch of different people. Uh, there are people in this crowd that are huge fans of who Jesus is. There's people in this crowd who cannot stand Jesus. What they have in, in, in similarity is that both of these groups of people are hanging on every single word that Jesus says. They're either hanging because they want to find hope in it, or they're hanging because they want to find a way to trip him up and arrest him. But these are people that are just fascinated with who Jesus is. And we see uh, this crowd have a relationship back and forth with Jesus all throughout the gospel books. Now, in Luke, there's an interesting thread that runs all across this book, is that Luke is fascinated by seeing how people identify who Jesus is. So part of the story today lies in how this crowd identifies Jesus. And the last character in the story is the blind beggar. We know some details about this person. Uh, in, our, in New Living Translation, what I read on Sunday mornings, it says he was sitting beside the road. Other translations, they give us a little bit more detail, and they say he was sitting at the city gates. So we have a blind beggar sitting beside the road, sitting right outside the city. Now, to take that detail a step further in, let's think about this now. Do you all know how there are just some intersections and, and, and certain places in town that we typically see people standing, like with the sign, like, we'll work for food? Like that, the, by the Walmart and Sam's Club and the mall on I-20 is where you always see people. 
And the first century, the place where people went to beg, where people went to get money, was right outside the city gates, sitting by the side of the road. So this guy is standing right in the place where he needs to be to find what he has to have to live to the next day. This is a society that really didn't have any system of welfare or or, or a way to take care of people who were living without. So I'm certain this man went out to that gate every single day waiting to get enough to eat that day, to, to make ends meet, to provide for whatever he had. And he was probably going and sleeping in, in, the, in the city, in the town square every night because that's where you went when you didn't have things. But this man identifies Jesus in an interesting way. So you see him sitting there by the side of the road. He hears noise coming. He begins asking what's going on, and the crowd responds to him. They say, well, Jesus, the Nazarene is coming. So the crowd identifies Jesus in a very simple way. This is where he's from. He's from Nazareth. He's Jesus the Nazarene. They understand who Jesus is, but how much they really understand about him. They're saying something that every single person could identify with. But this blind beggar then begins crying out. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So back to back, the crowd is calling me Jesus the Nazarene. And then you see this beggar calling him Jesus, son of David. So automatically we can tell that this beggar is identifying Jesus for more of the truth of who he actually is. He identifies and recognizes Jesus not by where he was from, but by who he is. So David was an ancient king of the Israelite people. He wrote uh, most of the book of Psalms. There's tons of stories about him, like David and, uh, and Goliath are familiar with that. It's the same guy. And the prophecy that the Messiah, that the anointed one who will come to save Israel and bring them back to God, will be from the line of David. So automatically, this beggar identifies Jesus for the hope of who he is. He's saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd tells him to shut up. I say, you're being too loud. You're being confusing. This isn't your place. Be quiet. The man begins hollering louder and more and more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's causing such a ruckus. In the middle of this crowd, Jesus sees him and hears him and asks to speak with him. And he comes to him and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, that's a pretty loaded question. Now, first of all, it sounds, kind of, it sounds kind of harsh. It sounds kind of snarky, but it's not. He, Jesus is being deeply intentional. He realized that this person has been making quite the ruckus to get his attention. So he immediately cuts to, what is your need? What do you want me to do for you? Now, if you think about it, this blind beggar has been sitting uh, outside the city gates, like right at that perfect place. But we also have another detail. Remember, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, by him asking for mercy, it's part of this identification with Jesus, how he truly sees who Jesus is. But also, have mercy on me is the first century, is the first century equivalent of that cardboard sign that says, we'll work for food. It's the, the typical thing that people said when they needed help. So you have this blind beggar sitting by the side of the road, outside of the city gates, and he's asking Jesus to have mercy on him. He has a list of needs that's going on every single day. And when he's at Jesus, he's seeing face to face, he finally gets his attention. There's numerous things he could ask for. He could say, well, listen, I'm really hungry right now. Can you help me out with that? Or, man, I I sleep in a horse stall at night. Is there any way you can help me out with that? Or I have this problem, can you help me out with that? Or I have this problem, this problem, this problem. But no, he doesn't. This isn't just some cute little kid Sunday school story. Look at what he asked Jesus. He immediately goes for it. He asks for the big thing. He says, Jesus, I need for you to help me to see. And I can take care of all these other problems on my own then. When I can see, that means I can work. When I can work, I can provide for myself. When I have the ability to provide for myself, I can take care of these other needs. Like all of these things that are plaguing my life right now hinge on the fact that you can make me see, you can fix that, and then I will be set free and given the ability to do amazing and big things in my life. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. 
Now, as we think about this, we think about this story, and we, uh, this, this whole thread of my personally start, had when I was reading this, and I started asking, realizing that there's one question that's going on in this that makes this story amazing. There's one thing that all of us, no matter where we live, when we live, how we live, if we're 2,000 years away from Jesus, or if we were there like in this story right now, that we can learn from this is this question. Many of y'all know that I'm a big fan of what ifs. I love what if questions because what if questions, they force us to think about changing things. But this is the question that kept rolling around in my head for days after I read this passage. And it's this, what if I was willing to let Jesus heal me of the thing that stops me the most? Because that's what the blind man did, right? What if I was willing, what if we were willing for Jesus to heal us of the thing that stops us the most. Think about it. He could have taken care of all sorts of tiny problems that day. But instead, he, he went for it. He says, Jesus, if this one thing can be fixed, it's stopping me. It's rendering me incapable of living the life that you want me to live. Will you fix this for me? Now, for him, it was pretty easy. He had a physical need that he'd be taken care of. This one physical need had the ability to help him fix tons and tons of other things that were plaguing him. And some of us might have physical things that we need healing from. But we also might have emotional. We might have psychological. We might have relationship things. Think about that thing that stops us the most. And what I love about this story is that, it, it, and for us to really dig into this idea of something that stops us the most, it means we have to take personal responsibility for ourselves. It means we have to look in here and realize, like, okay, this is a bottleneck in my life, and this has, this has been a bottleneck for a long time. And no matter what I choose to do around this or try to fix this or try to, to deal with ancillary issues, if this isn't fixed, I'm going to continue to be stopped. What if we were willing for Jesus to heal us of the thing that stops us the most? And I've said this before. What's hilarious, and I know this from my own personal life, half the time when we're, when we're terribly in, in, in fear or we, we feel inadequate or we're, there's something that we don't want anybody else to know about, we try to cover it up. And the funny thing is, by the way that we cover it up, actually what we do is we just amplify where everyone around us can say, man, Brooks over there, do you know what he deals with? This is his problem. He didn't want you to know it. That's this thing. What if we're willing for Jesus to heal us of the thing that stops us the most? And if we get down into it, if we really bear into why that, that, that terrifies us, is that we are scared. That we have fear. Because we know it's going to get rough. We know this is not going to be easy. Remember, it's that whole personal responsibility thing. It's the beautiful thing about faith is that we recognize we need Jesus and we ask Jesus to come and help take care of it for us. We're scared of what might happen. The best story I've ever heard to deal with fear and to deal with overcoming fear comes from my friend Drew. Drew grew up in this big Baptist church in Baton Rouge. And they had a revival meeting. How many of y'all grew up in churches with revival meetings? I had a conversation about revivals with somebody like 30 minutes ago. Okay. How many of y'all have never been to a revival before? Okay. Let me run you through what revival meeting looks like. Okay. First day, everybody's there. You have fun. Sing some songs. Second day, okay. We're kind of understanding what's going on. We're getting used to this. Third day, okay. It's starting to get kind of real. Last day of revival, everybody's going to be crying a bunch. It's going to get really emotional. It's going to get big. And in any revival, there's always that one person that's going to get really, really into it. And that's all right. That's what revival meeting is for. And this, at this church, when they had revival, that last night, the person that really, really got into it was the biggest, hairiest, and smelliest biker Drew said he'd ever seen in his entire life. Like this church had a couple thousand people in it for a revival meeting. They said that everybody knew, everybody was fully aware that something was going on with this guy. He was down at the front. I mean, it was cry time. It was sloppy. Like, like you got you're, you're the, the snot sniffles. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it was legit. It was big. So the next morning, 
Revival's over. 8.30 in the morning. Preacher's sitting in his office. And there's a knock on the door. He opens the door up and it's, it's this biker from the night before. He says, Preacher, man, listen, the last 12 hours have been radically different. I've never seen anything in my life like this. I feel everything's changed. This is beautiful. This is amazing. I, I, I thank you so much. I can't believe what life is like now. I can feel it. It's different. Man, whatever you need me to do, I will do for you. Whatever the church needs, I will do. I will mow the yard. I will fix the toilets. I will put, fix holes in sheetrock. I will do whatever you need me to do. And the preacher looks at him and says, I got a job for you. He presses the button on his phone. The secretary says, will you send the children's director in here? So the children's director walks into the office and sees the preacher sitting there and sees the biker sitting there and has this dumbfounded look on their face trying to figure out what's going on. The preacher looks over and says, I need you to teach third grade boys Sunday school. And the biker was like, I've never been to Sunday school before. And he says, well, it's all right. There's a book. This is the children's director. He'll go get you the book. And you just go over there and you read the book. So they take care of the book exchange, whole nine yards. A few days later, it's Sunday morning, and here's the class. And, uh, and it, the, the biker got sitting there. He has on, in the words of Chris Christofferson, his cleanest, dirty shirt. And there's 30 little third-grade boys in their Sunday best. My friend Drew was one of these boys. And he says this is the Sunday school that he will remember for the rest of his life. So they get in there, and the guy pulls the book out, and they go through the Sunday school lesson in like 10 minutes. And the boys have this dumbfounded look on their face because nobody's ever finished Sunday school early before. Sunday school doesn't finish early. And the, the guy asked him, said, well, listen, I'm done. What do we do now? And they said, well, nobody's ever finished early before. You got to teach us something. And he says, well, I've, I've taught you everything. I know. I've read everything in the book. I don't know anything else about this. And they said, well, you got to teach us something. That's what you do. You're the teacher. You got to teach us something. So he looks at him and says, all right, I know about two things in life. And I'll let y'all pick which one y'all want to learn about. He looks at him and says, I know about bush hogging, and I know about knife fighting. Which one y'all want to learn about? <laughs> now think about it. You got a room of thir you have like 30 third grade boys. Which one do you think they picked? And it wasn't bush hogging. <laughs> so he looks at him and says this, all right, y'all. First rule in a knife fight is you're going to get cut. Second rule in knife fight says you got to pick your blocking hand. Mine's my left. And he pushes his left hand up, and Drew said this thing was all scarred and pockmarked, and this little flap of skin was cut in half. And he said, whenever your blocking hand is, you don't do the button on this shirt so you can do this. And he has a snap shirt on like I always wear it. Drew says in about 1.5 seconds, this guy had the snap shirt completely ripped off and wrapped around his forearm. So 20 minutes later, all the mamas come in to pick up the third grade boys from Sunday school, and they walk in to 30 third grade boys in their Sunday best with their dress shirts wrapped around their forearm, holding them big fat crayons, and they're all doing that. <laughs> Silly story, but here's the deal, y'all. There's some genius in that. The first rule of knife ice, you're going to get cut. Now, here's the thing. Normal people don't get in knife fights. You know why? Because we don't want to get cut. <laughs> the genius of this story, and I love this story, I've told the story so much. The genius of this story is that guy accepted the inevitable. He knew he was going to get cut. And when we step into our lives and we begin looking at what's going on, when we begin asking that question, like, what if I was willing for Jesus to heal me of the thing that stops me the most? What if I was willing for Jesus to come in and to do the work in my life to take and to, to, to pull down that barrier that's there? You're going to get cut. It's going to be messy. It's going to be rough. It means things have to change. It means you might have to stop some relationships. It might mean you have to start some new relationships. It might mean, and it will mean some big things in your life, but you step into the situation knowing the first rule is you're going to get cut. And it's going to be messy, but it's going to be beautiful at the same time. Because when Jesus comes into our lives, he comes in and he cuts away the things that stop us. He cuts away the, can the cancer that is around our hearts. 
that he purifies us. He gives us the ability to step out in faith. To focus on him, to not focus on the things that stop us. We know we're going to get cut, but we know it's going to be worth it because what is going to be on the other side of things is better than what we're dealing with right now. So I'm just going to ask you that question and we'll be finished. What if we were willing for Jesus to heal us of the thing that stops us the most?